see so many of you here and sort of cuddling your fires and cursing the weather. <laughs> I may say, um, I picked Charles up from uh, Tweedbank and the river is running so yeah. high and brown and fierce. Sorry, uh, that's that's really quite, you know, Thank you. Um, a very big welcome back to Charles Burnett. So she looking at the wrong bit of her, uh, her thing. Um, he was Ross Herald of Scotland, uh, but he is now retired from that. But of course his main interest is in heraldry and that side of things. And he's spoken to us on several occasions before, both to us here, Thursday Group, and to the Friends of Kelso Museum. And really, I never know which, which one I've heard <laughs> from which, because I go to both. Um, he's going to talk about one of the, one has to say, very many forgotten Scottish queens. So Charles, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. A great pleasure to be back here in the waters again, down from my past nest in Banffshire. But uh, I'm sorry that I didn't bring better weather with me. <laughs> Today, I would like to tell you something of an almost forgotten Queen of Scotland and her legacy. Now, can you hear me properly? Yes. <laughs> I noticed you're adjusting things. As long as you can hear. Uh, the queen that in question came from a once powerful dukedom, composed of two areas in northern Europe: Ulrich, now in West Germany, and Gelders in the Netherlands. And these two territories came together in 1379 under William I of Judith. Hence, this impaled coat of arms. Now, those of you who may have been to visit Bruges in Flanders, you will be accustomed to this coat of arms, the black lion on the gold field, because that is still the coat of arms of Flanders to this day. Now, William, Duke of Gelderland, the man who brought these two territories together, was a formidable soldier who fought in Prussia with the Teutonic Knights, arranged tournaments, was an ally of England, and became the first foreign knight of the Garter in 1390. And this is why we have his coat of arms surrounded by the Order of the Garter. He had an extensive court which included his own herald, Gail Ray Herald, he was called. And this is an early photo, an early illustration rather, of uh, Clay's Heidenzoon, who was Gail Ray Herald, and he produced an armorial before 1396. And this is one page from his armorial showing Scotland's royal coat of arms and many of Scotland's nobles. So it's, it's one of the earliest coloured representations of Scottish heraldry that exists. The armorial is now kept in the main library in Brussels, in Belgium. So William encouraged his herald to get around Europe and get to know those nobles and princes who had their own coats of arms. Now, William died in 1402, this man, and he was eventually succeeded by a gentleman called Arnold of Egmont, who became Duke of Gelders in 1423. He married Catherine of Cleves, niece of Philip of Burgundy, and they had five children, and their eldest child was Mary. And Mary of Gelders is the lady who married our own king, James II, King of Scots, on the 3rd of July, 1449. He was 19 years old, and she was 16. Now, James had a prominent birthmark on the left side of his face, which gave him the nickname 
of James the Fiery Face. And these, this couple were to produce seven children, including James the Third and Alexander Stuart, who became Duke of Albany. Now, this is the sort of normal portrait one sees of James the Second, but this particular drawing was done by a German artist who visited the Scottish court and actually met James the Second and drew an accurate portrait of the king. And look, you can see the whole side, left-hand side of his face, is covered with this enormous birthmark. But that did not prevent him marrying Mary of Gelders, or it didn't prevent Mary of Gelders from marrying <laughs> him, because they had a very happy marriage. There you can see a much later illustration of Mary of Gelders on the right. This is taken from a Scottish armorial called the Seaton Armorial. It was painted in 1592, and it is now in the National Library in Edinburgh. And it begins with a series of portraits of Scotland's kings and queens. And this is what the artist in 1592 thought Mary of Gelders looked like. And she's wearing this wonderful heraldic dress, which of course is composed of her father's <coughs> arms. And in that same armorial, it gives Mary's coat of arms as Queen of Scots. So there you see on that side, the Royal Arms of Scotland, and on that side, the arms of Gelders. Sadly, as it turned out, James II was absolutely fascinated with a newfangled weapon of war called the gun, which was to revolutionize the art of siege warfare. And he's the king who received Mons Meg, this great cannon which was presented to him in 1454. It was a gift from the wealthy and powerful Duke of Burgundy, his wife's great uncle. It's always interesting when you have good relations <laughs> who can afford to give you expensive gifts like this. Actually, after the 1745 rising, <coughs> uh, the Hanoverian tro troops took Bonds Meg down to London and it was exhibited there for over 200 years, but eventually Sir Walter Scott, bless his cotton socks, <laughs> well known in this town, he persuaded the English to give Mons Meg back. And back she came in 1829, and of course has been exhibited at Edinburgh Castle ever since. But James was so interested in these guns that he set up a foundry in Edinburgh Castle to make smaller guns like this. This is called a bombard. It almost looks, uh, in a way, like a mortar. You know, it would just, just go on end and you drop the cannonball into it and bang and off the cannonball would go. <laughs> and so he decided to make smaller guns like this in Edinburgh Castle. And eventually, in September 1460, he wanted to come down to Kelso because at that time, Marchmont Castle, or Roxburgh Castle, as you may also know it, was held by the English. It's also, of course, called Marchmont Castle. And we have a herald here in Scotland who's called after the castle, Marchmont Herald. <laughs> That's a bottle of port all round. <laughs> not switching off your mobile. <laughs> now this castle, as you can see here, you know it better than I, but Isabel very kindly uh, drove me to Kelso this afternoon on this road, oh. going past the site of Marchmont Castle. That's where it lay on this important junction between the Tweed and the TV. Yes. Elsewhere where we are now up on top. <coughs> so James decided to lay siege to
to Martin Castle. There again, just to, to remind you where it's located, here's the retirement of Kelso, and here is a suggestion, a suggestion of what Marchmont Castle looked like, and it was held by Henry VI of England. It was in a very strategic location between the rivers Tweed and Tweed, and of course very close to the current border between Scotland and England. On Sunday, the 3rd of August, 1460, during the siege, a poorly cast bombard exploded near the king. He was struck by a piece of flying metal which broke his thigh bone and he died of his injuries. Isabel was telling me he was taken from the siege site to a friary uh, near the river's bank of uh, the Tweed. He never knew, sadly, that the siege was eventually successful and the castle was returned to Scottish control. His queen, now his widow, Mary, travelled to Marchmont with her eight-year-old son, James. She was appointed regent by the Scottish Parliament and on Sunday the 10th of August, a week after the death of the king, James was crowned King of Scots in Kelso Abbey. This great complex founded by David I in 1128. And here we are, we couldn't be nearer to Kelso <laughs> Abbey where James III was crowned King. <coughs> the corpse of James II was taken back to Edinburgh and buried somewhere within the confines of Holyrood Abbey. He was yet another Scottish sovereign whose final resting place is not accurately known. James I was buried somewhere in Perth. <coughs> James II, uh, somewhere near the Abbey. James III at Cambus Kenneth. James IV, his corpse after flog was taken to England and he's been lost. Uh, we have a sad <coughs> record of our sovereigns. Two years later, Mary decided, in memory of her most tender husband, to found a collegiate church dedicated to the Holy Trinity, the Blessed Virgin, Saint Ninian, and all saints. And the site she chose was close to Carlton Hill, southeast of the Royal Borough of Edinburgh. There you can see Edinburgh Castle, steeple of St Giles. Here is Carlton Hill. When this engraving was done, the top half of St Mary's Collegiate Church, Trinity Collegiate Church, is located there. Here is a better picture <coughs> of the church. It was never finished. They created a tower crossing with transepts and then a chancel and sanctuary. The nave was never built. The master of works for the project was called John Hockerston. The church, as I've mentioned, had an upsidal end, transepts, and a tower. Although the nave was never built, the church was the finest example of 15th century Gothic architecture in Scotland. And the first provost of this church was Sir Edward Bungle, and to assist him were eight chaplains and two choristers. The Queen also founded the adjacent Trinity Hospital for 13 beadsmen, <coughs> poor people who couldn't afford their own homes, so they were taken into the hospital and they had to wear blue gowns. Sadly, Queen Mary never saw her church roofed while she acted as regent, acted as regent for her son James III. She died on the 1st of December 1463 
and was buried in Brecon Cathedral. Once Trinity Church was roofed, Mary's remains were taken from Brecon and buried in a chantry chapel on the north side of the collegiate church. Now, why is Sutra Isle here? Because the prophets of Sutra and the land attached to it were then given to the Trinity Collegiate Church so that they could enjoy some of the money brought in from the Sutra complex. And in due course, when Edinburgh Town Council took over Trinity Collegiate Church, they pocketed the money that came from the Sutra estate. <coughs> Here is a detail from Gordon of Rothemay's map of Edinburgh. There is the Calton Hill, and here is the Trinity Collegiate Church. There is the Royal Mile, coming down to the great west port, which led you into the Cannon Gate, and down eventually to the Palace of Hollywood House. And this street, which is now St. Mary's Street, it takes a curve away down to Waverley Station. But that was the main road from Edinburgh down to Leith. Leith, of course, is up here in the north. But it went right past the Collegiate Church. There is the Trinity Hospital for the Beadsman, right beside the church. And the garden here eventually became what was known as the Physic Garden, which was the forerunner of the <coughs> Botanic Garden at Inverleith in Edinburgh. And the Nor Loch at that time was still full of water. That was eventually drained, and of course the railway line now runs along the site of that loch. Now here is a plan showing the truncated form of the church. It had two aisles, north and south. The north aisle was wider than the south aisle. Why? Well, just a whim of the mason, presumably. <laughs> And there is the little chantry chapel in which the Queen's body was eventually buried. The main entrance into the church was through this porch on the south side, and uh, then in you went, and uh, you could see the upside end. The Masonic work was of a very high quality, lots of very interesting carving about this church, including this particular panel, which shows the arms of the Queen's second son, John Stuart, who became Duke of Albany and eventually Governor of Scotland uh, when James V was a young man. But that panel was located there on this buttress. And you can see these other niches, which in its, their day would probably have all held uh, figures of saints. Uh, religious figures of various kinds. This drawing was done, of course, well after the Reformation, when lots of damage occurred to ecclesiastical architecture throughout Scotland by the bully boys of John Knox coming up from Edinburgh and doing all this damage. Unlike the English, of course, who damaged us. <laughs> Now, there are various surviving views of Trinity Collegiate Church, and of course this one, as I mentioned, shows the main entrance, and the building, uh, already mentioned, contained considerable carved work, both on the exterior and the interior, some of which was heralded. The arms of John Stuart, it's quite a complex coat, it's quartered, the first quarter has the Royal Arms of Scotland, and then there are the Arms of March, the Arms of the Isle of Man, which Scotland claimed at one time, and then the Arms of Annandale over there. The king owned all of these properties, and so the, this youngest son was given these heraldic record of the possessions. Now, a cast was made of this coat of arms, fortunately, 
And one of the places that holds the caste is <coughs> Abbotsford House. I mean, Sir Walter Scott was a great antiquarian magpie. <laughs> if he saw anything interesting, he would either have it or he would have it copied. And that coat of arms, if you go to Melrose into what they call the religious corridor, you'll see a cast of the Duke of Albany's arms. And Sir Walter had other casts made from Trinity Church, and you will see these in a moment. There is the apse, the bell, which would have held the altar of this church, because of course this had <coughs> Roman Catholic uh, services in it right up until the Reformation. And here we see the north side of the chapel, and this is the Chantry Chapel in which Mary of Gelders was initially buried. Well, she was buried for the second time. She'd been buried in Brigham, then she came here, and in due course you'll hear that she was moved yet again. <laughs> But there is her coat of arms, which apparently was carved on one of the buttresses of this uh, <coughs> chantry, <coughs> which sadly no longer exists. <coughs> Other carving in, in the building uh, have survived, and they can still be seen to this day. These are the arms of John Brady, J.B with a pair and a chief with three mullets. And then this was obviously on top of a pillar somewhere in the church. There's also this sacred mon monogram with the initials possibly of one of the ministers of the church, I.P. But this, of course, is Christ's I.H.S. along with M for Maria for the Virgin Mary. Here is a drawing of the roofscape of Trinity Church looking towards the governor's house of Hamilton Jail, which of course the jail was built after 1820. Another rooftop a drawing with interesting gargoyle there, nice pinnacle with crockets, that's what these are called in architecture, the funny lumps. <coughs> Rockets. And the crouching animal is an interesting piece of carving. Inside the chapel, off the north narrow aisle, with its own door, through this door here, went into the Chantry Chapel where Mary of Guise was buried. And inside that chapel, there was this lovely piscina. Now, Piscina in a Catholic church is a place where the communion silver is washed after a communion service. Uh, normally, there's just a hole here with a, a gap leading down into the foundations, and so the priest would wash the, the sacred uh, vessels in there. So that's why it's called a Piscina from the Latin meaning to wash. By this stage, when this drawing was done, uh, lots of damage had started to happen inside the church. Here is another drawing of what went on a wooden scaffolding uh, in the south transept with its beautiful window. Um, and there it may be taking a cast of the decoration there, because here is a very odd figure from the Trinity Chapel. This is a plaster cast, which is now in uh, Abbotsford. It's one of the casts that Sir Walter Scott had made. It was a way of binding up a prisoner in a very uncomfortable position with uh, a piece of wood between their knees and then their hands bound on either side, and you're stuck in that position for God knows how long. Not very pleasant at all. And if you go to Abbotsford, here are in, in, in the, at the armory, there's that figure I've just showed you, but these figures here were all taken from casts of the decoration in Trinity Collegiate Church. So Walter Scott was very taken with this particular building.
Now, what was the interior of this church? What did it look like? Well, fortunately, a marvelous English draftsman called Billings traveled round Scotland in the early part of the 19th century and made wonderful drawings, which were then um, transferred into engravings, and he produced a book on the uh, baronial architecture of Scotland, and he included Trinity College Church. And there you can see that some of the shields were left blank, which indicates that they may well have been painted with the heraldry. This is another stone which survives with two more heraldic shields, but so badly weathered you can really hardly make out what they are. But inside the nave, at the end, was this wonderful altarpiece, which the first provost, Sir Edward Bongle, had commissioned from Flanders. And this altarpiece still survives. It now belongs to Her Majesty the Queen, and it is exhibited in the National Gallery on the Mound in Edinburgh. This is the back of it. The middle panel has disappeared completely because it contained religious images, and at the Reformation, they would have been destroyed. But they <coughs> left this panel and this panel. This is the one that's of most interest. This is simply showing the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Ghost. But here is an actual portrait of Sir Edward Bonkel, and it's thought he commissioned this altarpiece from the uh, artist Hugo van der Goes in uh, Flanders. He is over his arm. He's got a very expensive fur piece of fur, which probably helped to keep him warm in the winter time. He came from a, a rich merchant, Edinburgh merchant family. And this angel in the background playing the organ, the angel's face, it has been suggested, is a portrait of Mary of Gelders. That is just a suggestion, but it's a, certainly a very strong face. The other real, the main side of the altarpiece, actually has been kept because it has a portrait of James III with his son, the future James IV, behind them St. Andrew, the patron saint of Scotland, and the Royal Arms of Scotland. The artist hasn't made a mistake. He's turned the lion so that it respects the central image. Now, we don't know what the central image actually was. This is something I've put in just to complete the panel, but we know it carried a portrait of the Virgin Mary and Child. On the other side is James III's Queen Margaret of Denmark, with her patron saint, St. George, behind her. And her heraldry is shown on this little desk. There's the heraldry on this panel, the Royal Arms of Scotland, with the lion turned round, the arms of Edward Bonkel and the arms of Margaret as Queen of Scots and as uh, daughter of the <coughs> King of Denmark. There's the Danish royal arms on that side. Do you notice anything different about the royal arms here? The top half of this double treasure has been left off. And this is one of the ways that this panel has been dated, because in 1481, the Scottish Parliament decided that the double treasure, Flory, Captain Flory, would no longer appear round the Scottish line. Why? Because James III was thinking of paying a visit to France, and the Scottish Parliament didn't want the French to think, because we had Fleur de Lis on our coat of arms, that we came under France for some reason. <laughs> It was quickly realized that it was a very bad idea to leave off the double treasure because the arms could then be confused with various other Scottish families who had a lion rampant. The only example we have in Scotland of the royal arms without the double treasure is this one here, and that is on the Bridge of Dee in Aberdeen. But Elgin Cathedral is an example. 
Calabro Castle has an example. The National Museum of Scotland has an example that came from Leith. And here's another example from Paisley Abbey over on the west. But you can see the top half of the double treasure in each case is missing. So that's why the Trinity College altarpiece also has this curious omission. Now James III, when he eventually came on the throne, well, yeah, he came on the throne when he was eight years old in Kelso, but when he eventually <coughs> became an adult, once his mother had died and ceased to be regent, he wasn't really very interested in his mother's church, Trinity Collegiate Church. He was far more interested in his own church at Restlery in Edinburgh, which is just sort of south, uh, sorry, northeast of uh, the Abbey of Hollywood House. All that remains of his chapel now is the lower half. But it was a two-story building with the most wonderful vaulted inside, carrying carved stonework. Here is a later impression of James III, and there is his signature taken from a document. Beautiful metallic hand he wrote with. Jacobus Tertius Rex Caturum. Uh, and inside this remaining lower half, if you look through the broken glass, you can just catch sight of some of the carved stonework that was found after the top half was demolished. There's a Kelly coat of arms, there's M for Maria again, the Virgin Mary, and IHS for the Crisis of Missions too. But they are still on inside. It's looked after now by Historic Scotland, but the last time I was there it was all closed up. We couldn't actually go inside and see it. Getting back to Trinity College, <coughs> after the Reformation, of course, it ceased to be a Catholic church. Uh, it was then turned into a Reformed church. And at the beginning of the 17th century, this lovely set of communion silver was commissioned for Trinity College Chapel. And inside, there was no altar any longer, no lovely altar piece, all pews, the central pulpit, so that people could hear the word. And next door to it, as I've already mentioned, was the Trinity Hospital. This is the end with this massive chimney gable. There is the chapel. Inside, interestingly enough, they had a plaster cast of the Duke of Albany's heraldry uh, behind this sort of uh, pulpit where the inmates, while they were having their meals, had to listen to a minister giving them the word uh, of the eight. And then we have one or two views of Trinity College in the latter part of the 18th century. There is a view, <coughs> excuse me, of 1753. There's another view, 1788, and this shows you where the roof line of the nave would have been. See there, as the, the nave would have come out from there. And of course, this arch would have been opened up so that you could see right through the complete church. Carlton Jail up in the background. Here, another early 19th century view, Edinburgh beginning to change, the new town being created over at the other side of the loch. The mound, all the excavated material from the new houses in the new town, they didn't have to do with it, so they just dumped it and it became the mound, and it became a vital road link between Union Street and the Royal Mile. The North Bridge by this time had been built to link the old town with the new town. Carlton Jail had been built, and in behind it still you can just see Trinity College roof scheme. 1825, another view by this stage, um, the this wonderful bridge had been built, uh, you know, leading from Princess Street up to Carlton Hill, with this wonderful arch and the screen. And this was still the main road down to Leith at that time. Um, rather more detailed, this is Billings again, this is Margaret's Draftsman, showing the church. One of the last watercolors made in the 1840s, 
from the north, Salisbury Crags in the background of the sheep. And then in 1836, we have a good plan of Edinburgh. There is the Norm Loch, Canal Street, <laughs> because you were right beside the, there's Union Street, Waterloo Place with the bridge. There is the Trinity Collegiate Church and the High Street with the road leading down to get you to Leith. But then, in 1844, <laughs> something happened. The North British Railway Company was founded with the intention of connecting Edinburgh to North Berwick in England. This is a coloured transfer. Sadly, it's been damaged. But there is a black and white version to show you that these it incorporated the arms of the city of Edinburgh with the arms of Berwick upon Tweed, the bear underneath the oak tree. And by 1846, Edinburgh and North Berwick were linked by rail. And in 1848, two years later, Edinburgh was linked to London by rail. But the trains had to come to Edinburgh somewhere. And Edinburgh Town Council sold Trinity College to the railway company. And there was one hell of a row. Because this was the finest piece of Gothic architecture we had in Edinburgh. And the Society of Antiquities of Scotland, they, they wrote to the government and the king. They made a terrible fuss. And eventually, the railway company agreed that the church would be taken down stone by stone and every stone numbered. So, 1848, down came the Trinity Collegiate Church. Here must be one of the last photographs with railway wagons sitting in front of the building. And there was this wonderful proposal by David Bryce, the great Scottish architect, to rebuild the church on the side of Carlton Hill, which would have been marvellous. A terrific site that came up Waterloo Place, up towards what's now St Andrew's House. You'd have passed the recreated Trinity Collegiate Church, but that wasn't to happen. What did happen was the creation of Waverley Station. And there you can see where Trinity College used to stand now covered by railway lines. And eventually they got a site <coughs> down here for the reconstructed Trinity Collegiate Church. This is the new street, St. Mary Street, or Jeffrey Street, I beg your pardon. Jeffrey Street, which came, came down to the back end of Waterloo Station and linked up <coughs> with the Royal Mile. And on that site there, a new collegiate church was built. And that's what it looked like. It was designed by John Lessels, the Victorian architect, and it was opened in 1877. He used some of the stones for this part of the building, but at the back they used the main body of Trinity Collegiate Church as the church hall. And there it is, and this is it now. It still exists. Stands there. The church eventually was surplus to requirements, and of course the Church of Scotland is quite ruthless. Once a church is defunct, get rid of it, sell it, get as much money as you can from it, and it was then demolished. And there you can see the remains of Trinity Collegiate Church, the sort of what you might call the, the chancel part of it. And these arches linked this hall to the church. The church was uh, site was sold off, and a wonderful new modern building was erected <laughs> in its place. Uh, it was originally a government building. It must be one of the ugliest insertions ever in Edinburgh. But I mean, Edinburgh's reputation with new building in it, it's just terrible and this is typical frightful it's now this is now a hotel it's a jury inn 
And you can still go through an arch here to the back of this building, and you can still see the remains of the Trinity apse. <coughs> as, this is it as a church hall with the apsidal end. Here's a view from the outside. It was used for years as a reading room by Edinburgh Town Council. Then it became a brass rubbing centre. And now if you want to see it, you have to write to the council and make arrangements to <coughs> get the keys and let you in. It's just, they're not in the least bit proud of this building, of the remains of this building. Here is a photograph of one of the windows. And there you can actually see still the numbering system that was used for the stones. They didn't bother scraping off the paint. Then a G, uh, and then this is how they were able to put this arch back together. They were left with some stones uh, left over, <coughs> so they just placed them outside in the little garden that is alongside uh, the, um, the remains of the church. As they demolished Trinity Collegiate Church. They came across two coffins. One in the Northern Chantry Chapel, which they took to be the remains of Mary of the Elders. But inside the church, they found another body. So that was another row, another argument. Which one is the Queen? Well, the one in the Chantry Chapel, they took to the Abbey of Holyrood. And in this unprepossessing building are the remains of several of Scotland's sovereigns, including Mary of Gelder. And there's a dreadful, badly drawn panel on this chapel. Queen Victoria was the one who gathered all the bones together and put them in this particular place. But here are the coffins of James V, Magdalene, the daughter of the King of France, whom he married in Notre Dame Cathedral on the 31st of December, 15, when was it, 1541, took her to Scotland, and she survived here for six months. Obviously, it was a bad summer. She couldn't stand the climate, and she died. He then went on to marry Mary of Guise. So um, he, he had two he had twin boys by Mary of Guise, and that proved that she could bear children, so he then married her, made the Queen of Scots. And the two boys are buried in here. And then, of course, we also have Mary of Gelders, uh, taken in 1848 from the Trinity Church in Edinburgh. But this is a very bad rendering of the Royal Arms of Scotland. I've been trying to persuade the Heritage Society of Scotland to change this panel completely and get a proper version of the Royal Arms on it. But we have other reminders of Mary uh, still in Edinburgh. At the, at the east end of uh, St. Giles High Kirk, which used to be, of course, the altar end of St. Giles, there, is, there are two pillars with heraldic capitals. And here is the capital showing the arms of James II and Mary of Gelders. It's now painted, makes all the difference. That's a photograph taken of it when it was unpainted. This is Mary's own seal. And this, as I've mentioned before, is a possible portrait of her. A very strong face, very strong face, rather an attractive woman with wonderful nose. Uh, if it is a picture of her. So we must not forget this lady who did so much for the architecture of Scotland and presumably now coming in her grave as to what happened to uh, her church which she built to remember her beloved husband. And it like many of our Scottish queens, historians haven't really paid much attention to her, which is, which is rather sad. But of course, the, the Scotland's queens were so important to continue the line. And of course, through her, we got James III, and then in turn, James IV, James V, Mary Queen of Scots. 
So let us think for a moment of Mary of Gelders who came to Kelso with her eight-year-old boy and had him <coughs> crowned next door in the Abbey. So Kelso has its place in history too, thank you well known. <laughs> thank you all very much. questions or comments? It always amuses me that of course all the Scots kings were terribly proud of being Scots, but they were so watered down from European wives and mothers and so on from all over Europe that the amount of actual Scots blood in any of them must have been pretty low. Well, the current queen, queen at least through her mother ah, yes. it's, it's a reasonable yes. amount of Scots. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I was getting all ready to ask about the arms of the Isle of Man, and then you yes. answered it in your talk. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, does anyone have any a comment to make at all? Can you add, give me information? Uh, I mean, I, as far as I know, James III is the only king to have been crowned in Kelso Abbey, but were there any other royal visitors over the years to Kelso? There must have been. I mean, it was not very much, wealthy. But... A lot to Marchmont. I think yeah. wasn't it at Marchmont that the first garter was was dropped, mm. if you can believe the myths. I mean, it was very much uh, while it was still going as a castle. It was used for quite a lot of. But then it visits. changed hands so many times. Right? That's right. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yes. The one thing I wondered was that I had always understood that there were two siege guns given, Mons Meg and the Lion, and that it was the Lion that was trundled down to the yeah. siege of Roxburgh, now that and I it didn't... was it that it exploded. Ah, well that I didn't know. Well... So <laughs> where, 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 what was your source for that as well? <laughs> One of many, many... Uh, <coughs> readings. Readings, <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Um, but that, that, that there were two siege guns presented mm. from Mons. Um, and that, uh, so the line hadn't been as well cast as Mons made. Presumably, and also that when these big siege guns exploded, because the barrel had been made in strips, they exploded as a sort of flower. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, they weren't cast as one great piece. No, no. no. And no, I managed either. to find quite a nice picture of, a modern picture, but of one of these guns deliberately exploded, and it, it, it is you quite dramatic. Yes. Um, I've no idea, because you never know from these pictures how big this model was, but it, it, it looks, it looked good. <laughs> yes, because the, the bomb bombs that were being cast in Edinburgh, of course, were tiny in comparison. Yes, yeah. when you think of one as made, and you get as fast. Yeah. Yeah, um, but anyway, that's something for you to find out from Absolutely, me. look up the line. Yes, <laughs> it could be anyone from Nigel Tranter. Just people yeah. shot. <laughs> I have, um, you read so many of these things yes. with all yes. sorts of... Um, Interesting snippets. Yes, and there's quite a lot of argument because, of course, how would you have brought a siege gun <coughs> if you were going to batter the castle from the floor's side, as it were, Surely the, the ground would have been so yucky yeah, that yeah. you could never have brought a really big siege gun down this far, down, down, down to this mm -hmm. part. They, they and then it would have to be firing up. Yeah, yeah. Unless they were firing it from the Roxburgh Castle side. I mean, they cut them. But then they've got to get it off the, across the tree to do that. Yeah. 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 Well, but they, they, <laughs> the arms they, they did fire it, and, and she, she could fire it almost three quarters yes. of a mile. Yes. Well, Stan is an ex-soldier, so... Um, but a pretty bad draw, did it? <laughs> yes. Bad straight draw. Could, could easily have travelled that distance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. 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 I speak with Amelia, where it was a hand. Um, well, it may, it may have been a Russian cannon, was it? We've got one in Banff. I mean, after the Crimean War, we've... We, Well, the, the, it was a hand. Well, if you can't remember seeing an, a double-headed eagle on it. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just a father. 
Rodas point to that, which is uh, yeah. just a big area. Mm. And there's the road area there. Of course, there's a cannonball house in Edinburgh, and it has an actual cannonball stuck in one. That, that's right, quite a huge distance. Yeah. And, and it was great fun, of course, when soldiers would actually garrison. Uh, if the child had been baptized in St. Margaret's Chapel, they would then stick it into the mouth of mom's maybe and take a photograph. <laughs> <laughs> that was quite a common practice. <laughs> The thing I always love is the, the, the soldiers are up at the castle. The mo most asked question by Americans is what time is the one o'clock gun? <laughs> <laughs> Americans don't have a clock. The church, which the foundations are also the lowest station, is there absolutely nothing that indicates where that was? No, at all? nothing at all. There's no. There's no sign or symbol or anything in a way for the station. Uh, and of course, it, it, in a way, there was Sir Walter so interested in the Trinity College, and for them to then call the station after his novels, <laughs> you know, it's very ironic, really, in a way, uh, considering his interest in the old church. Um, but you can still see the outside of the apse, you know, that part of the church, if you you walk up a little close uh, behind the jury in the next time you're then but just have a walk past and see it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do the antiquaries have records of their protests? Oh yes, there's, there's, it's well minuted and, and, and David Lang, the, one of the great antiquaries of the period, and he was a leading light in, in the battle to try and save it. The trouble was when they really can't be demolished the building, they piled the stones up on Carlton Hill. And of course, passers by, oh, that's a nice bit of stone. <laughs> and apparently, there are gardens in the new town with stones that came from Trinity College. So when they came to rebuild it, so to speak, they didn't have the complete set of stones. <laughs> it's a tragedy in a way. Tragedy. There's said to be a lot of Kelso with stones from yeah. the as well. Yeah. Any more questions? Well, now I've got the great pleasure in, in, in thanking Charles not just for this bit of history, but also giving us such a wonderful tour around Edinburgh as well. <laughs> and next time I'm up there, I start looking at places that I've never really looked at before. So thank you very much for training all the way down to Kelso oh, and for giving us such a wonderful <laughs> tour. Oh, thank right. you. but Veronica isn't here today, um, but there, I think we've actually got 21 and she's only put 20 down. I'm quite sure between now and then we would be able to just slightly increase the numbers that we, we've asked for. Um, so if you still want to go and you're not on the list, do put your name down and I will check with Veronica whether we can. Often somebody uh, doesn't, has to drop out at the last minute anyway. Next week's talk is third time lucky for Tim Usher. He's a retired captain of the Nat Watch, and he's from one of these endless military families, of course, and he is going to talk about his grandfather's life under a warrior's life remembered. Um, Tim is about my age, so Grandpapa would have been quite a long time ago. Um, this Sunday, the Yetham Village Choir and Colliery Band gives a concert at in what is described as Yetham Village Church. I presume that's the one at Kirk Yetham. There's not a church in town Yetham, is there? Yeah. No. So it has to be the one, Next to the, the black Hansel. one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, that's at half past seven um, this Sunday. Next Friday, the 7th of April, in the parish church, there's a Japanese pianist, Yu Kosugi, at 7.45. It's a quarter of an hour later because we start at seven with our AGM. It will be the last concert this year of the Music Society. Um, then a reminder again that on the 20th, we are sharing our meeting, it will be our last talk, um, with the Friends of Kelso Library. And you will also, we decided to advertise it so that anyone who wants to come is very welcome to do so. 
um, because it's about Traquair and we've got, and I've forgotten her name and I haven't written it down, yeah. the Lady of Traquair is coming mm. to give the talk. Mm. Um, so um, we thought that for once we would have tea and I think the friends of the library are going to bring cakes and things like that. But if any of you would like to make a cake, I'm sure it would be welcome. Um, I'm liaising with, with Hazel over that. Um, but you will be the host, so do please talk to people. You will know a lot of them, for heaven's sake. Um, but do please, you know, chat to them and, and uh, be your nice selves. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I will see you next week. Thank you. Thank you.